Blog Talk Radio. You're listening to Rockers and Recovery Radio. If you'd like to find out more information, go to rockersandrecovery.com or Rockers and Recovery on Facebook. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Hey, it's John Hollis with Rockers and Recovery Radio. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, we have a great guest today. He started out uh, back in the day with us when we first did our first shows uh, back in 2008-2009, Interventionist Keeley. Uh, Ken has been around the block and has helped a lot of people. He's been doing interventions since uh, 1989, and uh, he is uh, quite a character, but a great, great human being that helps a lot of people, and we're going to get Ken on the air with us now. And Ken, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, John, how are you? Good, good. I understand you're uh, in sunny South Florida. I am, well, up in Ocala, close. Okay. <laughs> so, what's um, what? Give us a little bit about uh, yourself. You know, you're you're basically coming back onto the shows, and I want people to understand who you are and what you do. Um, you are an interventionist. You're certified uh, board registered interventionist level two, and um, you also do a lot of other things to help uh, help the community and uh, to help people uh, to get into recovery. So give us a little bit of background on you. Yeah, we also just got a new credential, a certified manager interventionist. So it's for that continuum of care through Brining Institute. So anybody that's wow. interested in getting their but working in the industry, it's a great credential to um, really learn how to intervene, but not only intervene, but can follow them through the first few years of their recovery. Well, you, you say that, and it's funny because you wrote a book, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's uh, Face It and Fix It, which a, a lot of that has to do with later on down the road is really seeing that people, if you follow them all the way through for a couple of years, you can see the success rate better that way. Yeah, you see how the doctor diversion programs work. That's been in effect for over 30 years, and they have a 85% success rate, but they have a case manager following them for five years through that process. Wow. So, wow, so you really that. understand who's doing it and who isn't. Exactly, and you need that extra support because left to our own devices, you know, for all of us it gets tough on certain days, and if we don't have somebody holding us, I hate to say holding us accountable, but if somebody's not supporting us through the process is a better way to put it, it we're going to fall down and end up relapsing. Ken, if um, you had the opportunity back in 1989 to start uh, doing interventions and working with other people, um, how was that for you at the very beginning? I mean, was it tough for you? But when I first started actually doing interventions, I got sober in 1989, and then I worked for a nonprofit that was a drug and alcohol treat, uh, um, clubhouse back then um, in the early 90s. But I didn't really uh, – I, I had some time under my belt when I got sober and started working, you know, doing interventions. I had 10 years clean. So I wasn't somebody that just got clean and said, oh, I'm going to, you know, get in there and start okay. intervening on people. I had 10 years clean, and I and I started my uh, intervention company. Uh, that went on to you. Actually, were one of the three uh, first three people that uh, interventionists that were on the uh, show intervention on A and E. Is that correct? Yeah, I, my first. I think my first episode aired, aired in 2005, something like that. Did you find that being in front of the cameras and doing it was a lot different than um, doing it behind the scenes? It was, I'm sure it was trying to create and help the families and trying to help the, 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 the patients. But most importantly, you trying to hold all of that together had to take a lot out of you. No, actually it doesn't because it's, it's kind of like the cameras get invisible because the family work when you're doing an intervention is so intense. Like, you only notice they're there for the first five minutes. But once you start digging in the pre-intervention and getting them to open up, you know, they're so involved, I'm so involved in the process, that they kind of, you know, dissipate in the background, the cameras. 
And then, you know, I love, that's what I love about being part of the show is because it is a real reality show. They're not like telling me, go do this, go do that. We're just filming what really happens in a regular intervention. And then the day of the intervention, it's similar. You know, the only time they see the cameras is when you walk in that door. But after they walk in that door, we're sitting on that couch and everybody's open and pouring their tears out, as you could tell, as you always see. And they, they mm-hmm. kind of turn invisible. Wow. Do you feel that, you know, the intervention process, because there's a lot of people out there that say that you have to hit a bottom, um, that intervention doesn't really work unless the person's willing to get help. What is your thought process on that? Well, you know, and it's similar with the thought process about client-centered care. You know, it's like they say that, they put their client first and they don't need to do an intervention, but I don't know one addict out there that just gets sober because it's a beautiful day. And the more consequences that they have, the more engaged they become in the recovery process. So our my job is to work with the family system to figure out what the consequences are going to be and how can we magnify them and make them as dramatic as possible so they don't have to die. Because if they don't have that punch in the gut and get that dramatic experience of, you know, uh, hitting a rock bottom, they're going to keep using. And if they don't feel the discomfort, they don't stop. And if they don't stop, in today's world, we're losing 140 young adults a day from overdose. So my job is really intense. That i got to raise that rock bottom for them so they're not out there numbing themselves until they die. When you bring that process through and, and, and you have the person in the room and they say no, what do you do? Uh, you respect their decision. You do not debate it. You do not fight them on it. You just say, absolutely, we respect, you're an adult. We respect your decision, and we are okay with your decision. But now, moving forward, your family has made some decisions, and because you're doing illegal drugs, they're going to make sure their private investigators following you, and anytime there's illegal activity going on, you could go sit in jail, because at least in jail, we know you're not going to overdose. So you could sit there as long as it's going to take until you surrender and want to get into recovery. And if you never want to get into recovery, we're okay with you living the rest of your living years in jail versus on the street playing Russian roulette with your life. Uh, Ken, when you get that person to that point and you explain that to them, I'm sure there's a lot of anger that sees out at you. Oh, yeah, they get really upset. You know, they're, they're pissed off. They, their ease of getting high is no more easy. And that's our goal is where it's not easy to get high anymore. I mean, it's hard enough to you have to figure out where you're going to get the money because you've got to steal something or you've got to, you know, go in debt or whatever you have to do to get the money to buy the drugs. You know, um, and then when you get the drugs, you know, you're always looking for your next fix because you know it's going to run out soon and you're going to need more. And so it's that vicious circle. So that's all that's in their mind. And they're pretty, they're pretty numb to that mentality. But when you intervene on that mentality and say, oh, guess what? When you go to your drug dealer's house, not only are you going to get arrested, but so are your dealers. You know, we're having a private investigator follow you. And anytime there's illegal activity going on, They go ballistic because now it's like taking away their oxygen. This is what has been numbing them for all this time to not have to deal with the trauma that they've experienced. So they go in and they numb themselves. So using that as a, a, you know, self-medicating, and now you're going to tell them you're, you're taking away that medication, that's the only thing that works for them, they go ballistic. And that's why it's important when you do this is to have a treatment center on standby to have a bed waiting for them because once you take away their drugs, there's going to be a lot of emotions there. And you've got to dig to figure out where the trauma is and what are they self-medicating for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that underlying, those underlying issues aren't going to get taken care of in a day. Um, Ken Seeley Communities is something I want to touch base on now. Uh, in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, what What is Ken Seeley Communities? What's that consist of? 
Well, we are definitely client-centered care. You know, it's all about the client. But the difference in us and many treatment centers out there, we want to work with the interventionists there all over this country or all over the world that know that there needs to be healthy boundaries put into place to motivate the patient. And we welcome those motivate those tools to motivate them because without those tools, you know, you see that person all the time in treatment. They're sitting there and they're doing their time. They're not really there because they want to get into recovery. They're just doing their time. So we would rather use the family systems to help motivate them and that's what we specialize in is we, we want the intervention client. We want the one that's been through treatment numerous of time and the family has had enough. That's where we specialize. Good stuff. In, uh, KenSeely.com is one place you can reach Ken. You can also go to uh, Intervention911.com and you can call Ken anytime at 866-572-6911. Um, you can also check out uh, Ken's book. Uh, again, you know, Ken's book is uh, Face It and Fix It, and it was published in 2009 uh, by Harper. Uh, Harper One Collins, is that correct? That's it, Harper Collins. So let me, in closing, I mean, we have about three minutes left. I'd like you to just, uh, if you could, take a minute or two and, and tell people, uh, what they can, you know, what they can do that to help right now if somebody is having a problem. If you see some problems that someone's having and you see the red flags, as we like to call them, the first thing you do is just reach out for assistance because, you know, the, the weak person is actually the person that sits back and turns the blind eye and says things are going to get better or they may get better. It takes a stronger person to pick up the phone and say, hey, I don't know what to do. I need some help in this. And that's the addict themselves that had enough or the family members or the loved ones that are watching them spiral out of control. Asking for help is the strong person. So we, anybody could stand by the sidelines and just wait for a rock bottom, you know. And in all reality, these kids are dying every single day. You know, I just had a really good friend of mine lose their 25-year-old son for an overdose two days ago. And it's happening every single day. And we need to put an end to it, but it takes that strong person that's going to have a voice. Ken, I want to thank you again. You, you know, Ken's going to be down. We're doing, uh, of course, uh, the Unite to Fight Addiction meet and greet, a community meet and greet. And it's open to everybody to come in. Uh, in February, February 10th, and then uh, he'll be speaking at that and also speaking at the festival the next day on February 11th, the Rockers and Recovery Music Fest, the Love of Recovery Music Festival that we're having here in South Florida. You can check that all out at rockersandrecovery.com and, of course, Rockers and Recovery Facebook. Ken, again, we want to thank you for being a part of Rockers and Recovery, being a part of the show. You're the bomb, brother. Thank you, John. Great to hear your voice. It's good. Hey, it's good to be heard. <laughs> God bless you, brother. We'll talk soon. I want to have you back on as when we get closer to the event. All right. I'm excited about being down there. Us too. We're really looking forward to having you with us. Thank you again, Ken. All right. Have a great night. Yep. Bye -bye. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Rockers in recovery. We want to check out and, uh, of course, enjoy your night and uh, hope you enjoyed the listen. You're listening to Rockers and Recovery Radio. If you'd like to find out more information, go to rockersandrecovery.com or Rockers and Recovery on Facebook. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.